Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. This week, we're talking with Katie Petrie about her recent muzzleloading black bear hunt in New Mexico. With hunting seasons opening up around the country, I think it's uh, about time we start talking about some muzzleloader hunting here on the podcast. And uh, I'm really excited to have Katie on the show today to talk about her family history with muzzleloading and how that led to her recent muzzleloading black bear hunt. Listeners will know that I'm not a a great hunter by any means, but uh, hearing this inspiring story about Katie taking down this black bear with her grandfather's Thompson Center Cherokee is uh, is pretty energizing. I think uh, I think you'll enjoy this episode and uh, we'll catch you at the end of the show. So hi, my name's uh, Katie Petrie and um, I'm just a mom from Indiana. Um, I got into muzzleloading through my grandfather. Um, when I was a young kid, I um, loved to follow him around and I begged him to let me go hunting with him. So he was my inspiration into all things outdoors. I recently was very, very blessed and able to honor his memory by taking my first black bear with a traditional cap and ball muzzleloader that he gave me about 15 years ago. Um, He passed away two years ago. And since then I've been um, hunting almost exclusively with uh, with that muzzleloader. So this was a very special hunt for me. As a kid, I was just a scrawny little kid, and <laughs> I saw my grandpa taking my two older um, boy cousins hunting. And um, I begged him to take me, and, and he said, you know, oh, you're too little, you'll get cold, you won't like it. And so finally he was like, all right, you know, I'm going to have you shoot my 410, and you're not going to like it. It'll kick, and you won't like it but I'm going to let you do it anyway because you keep asking me. And so he let me shoot it, and um, I shot all the cans down that he'd set up for me. (laughs) And he got just an absolute kick out of that. And (laughs) I'll never forget him just laughing and bragging on me. And I was very, very young. I can't remember how old I was, but I was so proud of myself. And just that whole experience that Grandpa was so proud and that I loved it um, was kind of like the first thing that just got me just passionate about it. So, of course, after that, he let me tag along and taught me how to shoot a 22 and, you know, use a scope to hunt squirrels. Mm-hmm. And um, from then on out, shotguns. He was with me when I killed my first deer. I think I was 14 and uh, used his used his uh, Winchester 20 uh, gauge shotgun. And he was just happy as could be. He just was thrilled. And all, it was just a, a yearling doe. And he thought that was like the biggest buck in the county. You know, he just thought that was everything. Uh Wow. So, yeah, it was a really interesting, a really fulfilling relationship between me and my grandpa. Um, I wasn't the only grandkid. I wasn't the only girl, but we had a very special bond over um, anything to do with the outdoors. That's just wonderful that, um, I mean, you were a persistent little kid, you know, sticking after it. And then, you know, oh, yeah. he, he embraced that and, and helped foster that. That's so great. I love hearing oh, that. Definitely. I mean, a lot of adults, I mean, I'm a mom of three daughters and, you know, it's easy as an adult to say, that's too dangerous. You're too young. Mm-hmm. Um, that's too hard. You can't do it you know, ask me another time, but he took the time to teach. And that looking back was just a really wonderful, like thing for him to do. If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be, I mean, I wouldn't have this passion that I have now for, for the outdoors. And I wouldn't be teaching my kids the same stuff that he taught me when I was little. That's great. That's great. You're already passing it down. Yeah. I'm already passing it down. (laughs) Carrying the torch. Yeah. So yeah, he, um, he passes a muzzleloader down to me. It's a Thompson Center Cherokee. Uh, it's a 45 caliber, and I've got a 32 caliber barrel that I can put on there too. Um, he gave it to me. I was 19, and I was over. You know, I live with my mom and dad. I was in college at Purdue, and um, he just showed up at the house one day when I was home from college, and he had it in his hand, and he had a grocery sack full of bullets and powder and patches and mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff, and he said, "Hey." Um, I'm giving you this gun. This is yours now. And I was absolutely floored. I just was like, uh, okay, why? He said, because I want you to have it. And because I know that, you know, you can't just look at it. You're can't hold, you know, hang it on the wall or put it in a (laughs) safe. I want you to kill stuff with it. And I was like, all right. And I think he knew that I would. And uh, he could have picked anybody else to give it to. But for me, that was like super, super meaningful that he chose me um, 
And so I took it very personally that, you know, this is something that is special. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So <clears throat> I tried to hunt with it. You know, Indiana has a late muzzleloader season every yeah. year. Um, and I'd take it out maybe one weekend every year just to say I did. Mm -hmm. And I've never killed a white tail with it, um, <laughs> which is hilarious because I've hunted since I was a kid. But, you know, I'm sure there was a few years in there while I was having little tiny kids that I didn't. Mm -hmm. But most of the time I'd, I'd make sure to at least take it out for one hunt just to, you know, just to do it. Um, and uh, for some reason, this hunt was... I like, I do enjoy bear hunting with hounds. I've done it before in Maine. It was a wonderful experience, but I didn't get a bear. Um, just didn't have a chance mm -hmm. at one. And, uh, it was still awesome. And something that I feel very strongly about, um, you know, hound hunting, a lot of people have a negative idea of it, but it is one of the most primitive tools in hunting that, yeah. that people have used. And I find that to be a very honorable tradition. Um, and so for me to use, um, you know, traditional muzzleloader and be hunting with hounds um, just a, two weeks ago and in New Mexico in the wilderness, um, that was a very surreal and kind of a little bit of a, I guess, spiritual experience in a way. Yeah. Um, you know, when you when you're hunting with primitive weapons, it just makes you feel a little bit more connected to people that have come before you and um, those experiences that you've heard ab about other people having and in the history books and it's pretty cool. Yeah. So yeah. could you elaborate a little bit more on the, on the dogs? I love working dogs and dogs that mm -hmm. have a job. Are you training the hound that's in the picture that I'm looking at here? No, nope. <laughs> I, 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 uh, went with an outfitter Okay. that I found online. Didn't know him from Adam. <laughs> um, but he had a lot of good reviews and you know, it's in the Gila area so that's a pretty good area and i wanted to check out a new state i've been the last handful of years trying to hunt in a different state every year okay cool. um so yeah so um found them online um gila and apache outfitters um, out of reserve new mexico and they were great people the houndsman that works for the outfitter he is a 21 year old young houndsman um and i you know of course was a little surprised that he was so young when I first got there and they're like, yep, she's going with you. Um, but it worked out great. And, uh, his dogs were his own and he's been hound, a houndsman for about four and a half years, he said. Hmm. And it was, it was awesome. It yeah. was really awesome. Um, you know, we talked and talked about, you know, how he trains his hounds and this and that. And, um, he's, his name is Josh Sanchez and he was just a really, really good guide. And of course he commented on how sometimes since he's young clients kind of underestimate him, mm. you know, and I'm like, well, you know, as a woman, I get underestimated all my life. <laughs> so, <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> so I, you know, obviously I show up there and I have, uh, I, I kind of, I didn't lie, but I omitted the truth about my gun to my, to the outfitter. So I sent him a text and I said, Oh, Hey, by the way, is it all right if I bring a muzzleloader? And he said, sure. You know, um, but obviously he wasn't <laughs> thinking about, uh, you know, a Thompson center Cherokee, uh, with a 45 caliber, uh, leg conical, you know, he wasn't Open thinking I was going to and... <laughs> yeah, pour my own powder down the barrel or any crap like that. Right. So, um, <laughs> gosh, so I'm this, you know, this, this mom of three just showing up alone in New Mexico to hunt bears with this gun. And I'm sure I was a sight. Um, but on the very first day, uh, we went out and me and just me and the guide and his hounds, and we got on a pretty fresh track and we released the hounds on the first track. They, they caught up with that bear within about three miles and treat it pretty quick, but it was in a really hairy, um, Canyon, mm. uh, very, very steep. And in Indiana, you know how it is. We're both Hoosiers. Yep. And so uh, when you see something that steep, that you don't walk on that, right? Yeah. In Indiana, <laughs> that, that's not, you don't do that. You find another way around. Uh, yeah. But this is just, we're, we're going straight down to the very bottom where the creek is from the top of the mountain. And that's where the big tree is that the bears climbed up, right? So I'm like, uh, okay, if he can do it, I can do it. So we made it down there without anybody tumbling down the mountain and um, walked up to the tree and it was a very, um, surreal 
experience. Uh, have it on video for a lot of it. Oh, wow. Um, just cell phone, you know, mm-hmm. just kind of very amateur. But um, walked around, looked at the tree, and I was thinking to myself, you know, like, you know, kind of pa- took a pause. Like, is is this the bear that I want, right? So mm-hmm. first day, first first track. And I took a look at it and I thought, yeah, I think, I think this feels, everything feels right. So of course this bears, the guide's like, you know, this is the farthest I've ever seen a bear go up a tree. It's pretty far. <laughs> and it's on, it's on a great big limb, smashed itself down, you know, laying mm-hmm. on its belly on this big limb and I could barely look. And I'm like, that's not a shot I can take. And, um, so he's, he's looking through his range finder and he, we find a good spot. I'm standing in a creek um, to get the best shot that I can get. And he's like 60 yards. And I told him, you know, 50 yards is about my max, Mm -hmm. um, that I'm comfortable with. And I said, that'll do if I can get a better shot. And he's like, okay, let me go. He took a stick and he's like, sometimes you knock on the tree, the bear will move around to see what you're doing and you get a better shot. So he goes up there, he's got the hounds all tied back and everything. And, Mm -hmm. um, he knocks on the tree a couple of times, this big stick and, The bear kind of stands up, you know, sits up and it leans out over the tree and it's looking me right in the face. And I've got a perfect shot of its chest. And he's like, if you've got a good shot, go ahead and take it. And so, you know, I pull the set trigger and he's he's got his camera out trying to video for me. (laughs) Well, he didn't know about my gun. He didn't know it had two triggers. Right. Right. So when he hears the click of the set trigger, he kind of fumbles his phone because he thinks that it's a misfire. (laughs) And then when he hears that huge boom, he was really startled and he almost dropped it. But right at the last minute, he he gets it pointed straight and you see the bear hit the ground. (sighs) And like I look like the biggest dork because he pans to me and I'm going, holy, you know, <laughs> and um, I'm, I just look like an absolute dork and I don't care at all because it was the coolest thing ever. Yeah. And um, one shot and it didn't stand up again. And I was like, holy junk. I just did it. Wow. Holy moly. I drove 24 hours from Indiana to New Mexico, this old gun with nobody knowing. And, uh, <laughs> you know, my parents are probably worried out of their minds and I just did it. Holy mackerel. Um, it was awesome. And I thought I'd cry cause it was very, very meaningful to me, yeah. but I didn't in the moment. I didn't cry. It was too much fun. That too adrenaline much fun to cry. was probably pumping. Oh yeah. But you know, I thought I'd be shaking like a leaf pulling those two triggers. Cause mm-hmm. I know that gun, the gun kicks like a mule. Um, obviously, uh, just nature of muzzleloader sometimes. And, um, I knew it was, I have like, you know, the way I hold it against my cheekbone always gives me a bruise on my face when oh. I shoot it. And so I'm anticipating pain, right? Mm. And my adrenaline's pumping and I'm like talking to myself in my head, like, don't you freaking flinch. Don't you even do it. You're not coming this far to miss. And I didn't. <laughs> it didn't miss. <laughs> That's awesome. Not even close. Yeah, I've got a picture which I'm not, I haven't posted on social media or anything. Cause people are sensitive about that kind of content, I guess. But yeah. I wanted to take a picture of just, you know, the entry and everything. Cause people, I mean, I had some acquaintances talk trash to me over the years about that gun. You know, it can't mm-hmm. kill a deer. You, you like, is that even an accurate gun? That'll blow up in your hands. You know, people yeah. said all kinds of stuff. Like you can't kill a deer with that. that and uh, it's nuts. too old. It'll fall apart. Like, that's not even reliable. And I'm like, all right, tell me I can't do it. I'm going to do it and prove you wrong. (laughs) So there's a lot of people um, eating crow over that gun. Oh, good. This week. So that's what we like to hear. Good, right? Good. (laughs) We all like to hear that. And so, uh, yeah, I I loaded it with um, 70 grains of pyrodex and. I had a lead conical, like a Great Plains style Mm -hmm. um, bullet, 285 grains, and uh, I lube it with Crisco. Okay. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, that did the job. I got it done. Yeah, and a lot of people, you know, they don't shoot muzzleloaders like that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, It scares people to see pouring loose gunpowder down a barrel, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, So, you know... I feel like it's just now sinking into me, like how big of a deal it looks like from the outside of a, a woman by herself going out and doing that. Yeah. And with a big old Hawken. Yeah. 
Huh. So pretty cool. <laughs> so what did the what did the outfitters think? What did the guide think? Oh, you know, when you brought was it great. back, the guy the the guy the guy that was with the houndsman man, he just he he laughed. He's like, good shot. Um, you know, and it was funny and we, you know, we skin quartered it, packed it out on our backs back up that mountain, which was worth every terrible, terrible step. I was going to say, that's a, that sounds pretty hefty. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a rough one. It, and, but you know, people say that hunting with hounds is so easy, right? Mm. And it's just like shooting fish in a barrel. They've never hunted with hounds. They've never bear hunted with hounds, especially. And, um. You know, I know how it is. I know the truth of it, but it's so difficult to explain to someone who doesn't, doesn't understand um, yeah. hound hunting, like how it is actual, it is a free chase hunt, in my opinion, um, that it is a primitive method and it's absolutely um, something that we need to protect and preserve yeah. for future generations. But anyway, we get back to the, um, we get back to the lodge and, you know, the, the outfitter and the other guides and the cook and everybody, um, they'd seen my gun that morning, you know, when we all got up to go out in the field early. And uh, that's the first time they all kind of were like, oh, she's taken that old thing. And I was out of five hunters on the first day. I was the only one that was successful so far. There we go. So I, the chick with the old gun yep. <laughs> brought back the bear. Just busting uh, them down, I, aren't you? I, I, I was tickled pink about it, and everybody loved it. They were all so um, so happy about it. Just they were tickled, and um, even the other, you know, the other clients, the other hunters, they just thought it was great. So they all wanted to see the gun. They wanted to see, you know, my my bag with all my muzzle loading supplies in it. It's mm-hmm. like hair. It's a hair on elk, you know, bag. So nice. it looks pretty looks pretty uh primitive if you will say so they all they all got a kick out of it and then when i showed them i was using a ziploc baggie with crisco in it um (laughs) they thought that was pretty you know funny too um but yeah they they were very excited and they especially loved that it was a gun that was given to me to pass down and uh yeah really cool experience and everybody there was great um i also got to tag along after that with the other hunters hunts. Oh, cool. So, yeah. So there were four other hunters and they were actually two pairs of father son hunters and the sons were probably in their thirties, I'd say around my age. And, um, they, uh, one group was hunting with hounds and one group was wanting to spot and stalk. So I got to experience some spot and stalk bear hunting for the first time. Hmm. Um, I had my binos just in case, you know, and I had all kinds of stuff in my car because I drove out there. So, of course, I you're, just wanted to be prepared. Up. I was set up. So, I went out with them another three or four days, and um, I left on the on the last day. So, I wanted to, you know, do some sightseeing and stuff in New Mexico before I headed back home. And uh, the other, those other, t- both of those other pairs ended up each getting a bear um, to take to take home with them. So I think, uh, one was with hounds and one was spot and stalk in the end, but I wasn't there for it, but (laughs) I got to see the whole struggle the whole way through the week. And Mm -hmm. it was awesome. It was, it was really awesome experience and, uh, wouldn't trade it, man. It was totally worth it. (laughs) Worth the 24 hour drive there and back. Oh yeah. (laughs) Big time, big time. And you know, we did, um, on my bear, we did pack all the meat out and, um, I saw in my freezer at home. Uh, left the hide to uh, have a rug made at their taxidermist in New Mexico. Oh, so. cool. Oh, yeah. My kids are so excited. They've uh, already got a spot picked out on the wall to hang it. So. <laughs> I was going to ask what, you, what your kids thought of that. Oh, yeah. They just, you know, they they think they have the coolest mom in the world. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, no no dispute. And they like to tell everybody that asks anything about it, the story. <laughs> Yeah. Make sure they went to school the next day. We're, and we're <laughs> oh, well, I think they'd already told their, their bus driver um, that I was going on a bear hunt because when I texted her to, about who's going to be getting them on and off the bus, she uh-huh. said, well, I'd heard that you're going on a bear hunt, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. I love that. And I mean, yeah. just, everything about it's just great. I just love it. Was that. Awesome. So, it was awesome. It was awesome. How, I mean, I, I can see the picture here, and and you look pretty tiny compared to the bear. I mean, this there's no like photo trickery here. This that's no, I, that's I'm, the bear. I'm not very big. I mean, 
I'm five four. I'm about 120 pounds, and um, that's how much bigger the bear was. We obviously didn't weigh it. Um, right. We're out in the middle of the wilderness, but I'm very happy. I, I feel like it's a very good specimen. Um, obviously, there's much bigger bears out there where I was, and there's much smaller bears mm-hmm. out there where I was. So it's a dark chocolate um, coat, and I just I think that's pretty cool. Um, when I hunted in Maine before, you know, out east, there's no color phase black bears. Okay. So, um, I didn't, that didn't even cross my mind when I was hunting bears out there, but, you know, going west, um, black bear, black colored black bears are actually a little more rare to see than the other colors are altogether. So Hmm. I'm pretty excited about it. (laughs) I can tell. (laughs) Yeah. So what's next now that you've, you've bagged your black bear? What's (laughs) next? Well, I'd like to keep that a little closer to the chest. Okay. okay. Um, you know, keep your keep your plants quiet yep. and hustle. Um, I like that. But obviously, I'm going to be taking my kids out during deer season with me. Uh, last year, I hunted every single hunt with them. I think that's awesome. Um, all three of them tagging along. And what's that like? Um, it can. I mean, it just depends on the day for them. If, mm. if they feel like it, if they really don't want to go, I'm not forcing them out there. Mm-hmm. But I do have positive reinforcement usually, and it's chocolate, uh, hot chocolate. So <laughs> the rule was last year that if, if they go out with me um, and they're really quiet and they're good, they get hot chocolate with marshmallows. And they stay out the whole time. If they go out with me, they stay out the whole time, but they're loud and they gripe or they, you know, get fussy. No marshmallows, but they still get hot chocolate. That's so delightful. that was my, yeah, right? So like just... Uh, positive reinforcement there for yeah. them, but there, I we they talked to me today actually about mom. We want to go with you next time. We like what's the next time we want to go with you? And I'm like, you can totally go with me, um, just not when we're climbing straight up a mountain. You know, not yeah. probably ready for that. They're um, nine, eight, and five. Okay, so they can go deer hunting all day long, but they, in Indiana, you know, I live on a our family farm, and um, We live about half a mile from my parents, so it's nice to have close family and a lot of land to hunt. It's mostly just me hunting it, and Mm -hmm. uh, they were, you know, when I'm marching out there with this little, you know, single file line of girls behind (laughs) me, I'm not really bothering anybody. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. It's it's fun. I, you know, never thought I'd be an all-girl mom, but. Here you it's are. not a bad gig. It's not a bad <laughs> gig. It's pretty cool, really. Well, God definitely knew what he was doing when he decided that. <laughs> what would you say to other to other moms or other ladies out there in muzzleloading or or in hunting? Um, you know, do you have any tips or, or suggestions for for other women trying to get more involved in in shooting sports and, and hunting the outdoors in general? I know it's it's a very intimidating thing to get involved in, especially if you weren't raised, um, with any type of mentor to show you any of it when you're young. Um, I was very blessed. Um, so sometimes, um, women don't even try just because of how intimidating it is. Mm. Uh, what I would recommend is number one, you can do any of it and all of it. You can do anything that, that a guy can do when it comes to hunting. Um, and, uh, don't be intimidated, get in with, you know, there's a lot of Facebook groups and even on Instagram, there's some communities that are all women hunters, um, where especially some of those Facebook groups that men aren't allowed in the group, it's a private group. So you won't feel so intimidated, hopefully. So when you're asking questions and you're looking for advice um, and you're learning things, it's all women, um, supporting each other, being so super positive, and it's a really, really good thing. Um, so get involved with some of that stuff. Take hunter's education. Um, if there's a su- specific um, method of take, like muzzle loading or something like that, you know, join the NMLRA. Um, go to some, you know, shoots and watch and observe for a while. And uh, eventually you'll be able to um, find some type of like group activities, kind of like a, 
I don't want to name names, but there, some mm. of those women organizations will have duck hunts just for women. Okay, um, yeah. And they'll have deer hunts just for women, fishing trips just for women, so you can get experience outside. And then maybe you could start venturing off on on your own public land or private land or whatever. But um, my advice, number one, is just start somewhere. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help because even men start at scratch, right? Like oh, yeah. even men start off not knowing. So don't be intimidated more just because you're a woman because, um, you know, I've re- received a lot of uh, – um, advice, um, from, um, strange men on the internet, right. (laughs) Over the years. And, um, you know, one or two sentences in, you can tell they have no idea what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. So you just smile and nod, smile and nod and ignore them. Um, you know, I may not look like it, but it's like, uh, deep down, I'm just kind of like a little old man, you know, like one of those little <laughs> old men you see at like friendship shoot, right? Yep. I'm just kind of like the same type of hobbies and interests. Yeah. Um, you just don't see it from the outside, so uh, don't don't be intimidated by any stranger on the internet telling you that you don't know what you're talking about because just like any other topic on uh, social media, there's always going to be people putting their foot in their mouth. Yeah, it's always easier to talk than it is oh, to yeah, they just to want attention and, and yeah. they you know the funny thing is like they'd never say that to your face. Right. Right? Yep. So people make a lot of a, a lot of assumptions on that. <laughs> on on their keyboards and things, yeah. Sure, sure about everything. <laughs> Hi, Ethan here um, from the future since the recording of this episode. But I wanted to tell you uh, kind of with this podcast, we're launching the uh, I Love Muzzleloader hunting hat giveaway. Uh, so my partner in crime, Rod Scobie, has set up and uh, and made up a bunch of I Love Muzzleloading hats to give away to muzzleloading hunters around the U.S. for the 2021 hunting season. So if you want a chance to win a hat, you can tag us in your muzzleloader hunting photos on social media or email them to us and you'll have your chance to win for each month. So uh, we have three categories. We have traditional muzzleloader, modern muzzleloader, and then youth muzzleloaders. Uh, so you can submit in any of those three categories uh, each month, October, November, December, and January. And uh, we'll pick a winner in each category at the end of the month and uh, we'll mail you a hat free of charge. You know, no cost, you know, no cost to you. It's a, it's a free hat. You know, who can argue with that? This podcast is brought to you by Thor Bullets. Thor Bullets are a premium full bore muzzleloader bullet designed specifically for modern inline rifles. Thor bullets do not require plastic sabos or belts to be fired, meaning less cleaning for you between shots. The patented copper base creates an airtight seal, giving you greater distance and accuracy. Thor's unique engineering allows the bullets to retain 95% of their weight upon impact, and the controlled expansion ensures large, easy-to-follow blood trails. Thor bullets are currently available in a 50 caliber version that is sized to your specific bore. Thor is also expanding into a new 45 caliber bullet designed for faster 1 in 24 and 1 in 22 twist inline rifles. For more information on these great bullets, visit www.thorbullets.com. We'd like to thank Thor Bullets for their sponsorship of this podcast. I don't know that I'd ever have the gumption to go hunt a bear, but seeing this, that's just, and hearing the story is just so cool. Oh, it was. I'm still just like pumped about it. Like I smiled to myself, re- rethinking, like remembering the whole thing. I'm just yeah. like, <laughs> like, you know, and I think I've always been the type of girl ever since I was a little kid, whether it had to do with sports or anything else that, you know, I can do whatever anybody else can do. Mm-hmm. And uh, you tell me I can't and I'm going to do it anyway. And um, yeah. And, you know, another thing that I'm really passionate about is, um, you know, women and getting women and children involved. And um, yeah, how can we, you know, how can our listeners and, and myself included, how can we do a better job at, at, you know, making the sport and the hobby more open and, and get more people involved from your perspective? I would say um, having family events um, that people in the local communities can come to and learn safety or, um, you know, learn about shooting a bow or, you know, they have the women in the outdoors events. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of DNR across the country has uh, different events that you can learn things. I'd say more um, advertising for stuff like that, more events like that. I think that's where, um, you know, especially maybe like a single, a single mom with a couple of kids, 
um, might be the best place to get them feeling comfortable, like coming out somewhere that's an organized event like that with other people that have young children and stuff like that. Yeah. Maybe that's something that we can uh, start pushing more for trying to get, you know, some more family oriented, accepting events um, up and going. I think a lot of times we all get kind of entrenched in, you know, or, or can get entrenched in kind of the super serious and the, you know, making sure it's the same thing every year. And I think changing it up and, and being more welcoming never hurts. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, in our different organizations, we think we are being welcoming and mm -hmm. we think we are op opening it up to the public. But sometimes, you know, just that the knowledge isn't out there that that's available or the way that we are requesting, you know, the the first time hunters to come in. It's, it's not look this looks super scary. Um, I know like, you know, for NMLRA, those shoots are amazing to watch, but it's intimidating for someone who's never experienced it before. It's a oh, lot yeah. of people. There's a lot of loud gunshots, right? Um, a lot of, you know, people dressed in the period clothes, which is so much fun. Um, but if it's your first time, I remember my first time was, I was, was probably like 15 years ago and I showed up to a spring shoot, um, for, at friendship and I was like what the heck is this but in my next <laughs> breath I was like this is awesome yeah right yeah. like whoa this is cool so yeah having maybe like um I know like at uh the Indiana like deer and turkey expo or whatever they have a few little booth areas set up where kids can shoot a bow mm -hmm. right it's pretty much a toy bow, but kids can shoot a bow. Kids can get in line and kids could experience something. And I think um, that is where you start is with the kids. Yeah. I think if you can kind of pique their interest and expose them to something new, I think, you know, I, I don't have kids of my own yet, but I think that uh, kids are kind of a sponge. And if we can mm -hmm. show them how great all of this is and how much fun it can be and you know, as they age, we can show them how important it is to preserve these traditions and, and help conserve the wildlife and, and the heritage of all of that. I think it becomes important for them as well. Exactly right. And even if they don't become hunters, they will still have a respect and an understanding of what hunters are doing. Instead yeah. of judging hunters, we'll have another advocate on our side even though they might not participate in the events. Yeah. Uh, when you were talking about... Uh, you know, some of the disagreements people have about hunting with dogs and things, it really sounded a lot like some of the same arguments we hear about muzzleloaders when you started Absolutely. talking about how people perceived and your the muzzleloader that you're using being inaccurate and dangerous and things. But, <laughs> you know, humans have been hunting with dogs and muzzleloaders for a very, very long time. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. And it uh, got us to here where we're at today. And I think, you know, Maybe n nothing's perfect, but I, I think uh, muzzleloaders and dogs did a fine job. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to see the the pure determination and purpose on a dog's face mm. um, when they are doing their job, whether it's a livestock cattle dog herding cattle, right, uh, or a dog that is, you know, baying a bear, it's the same thing, and it's wonderful to see as a, as an animal lover. You know, yeah. Um, you know, and honestly, with when it comes to livestock dogs, they are fulfilling a purpose that is eventually leading to the death and con consumption of that livestock. Correct. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But the same exact situation with the hound dog. So why is a hound dog the the you know bad guy? Yeah, I hadn't thought about and that. And the livestock dog is the good guy. Mm -hmm. Why? No difference. They're both dogs doing their job that we've asked them to do. And in the end, they're putting food on our table. Yeah. So I think that's interesting. I do but too. I, I like that. I'm a, you know, I went, like I said, I went to Purdue. I, I'm a registered vet tech. Oh, nice. So, um, yeah. So I love animals. Um, I've worked in general veterinary practice. I've worked in emergency and critical care. Um, and now I work in an animal welfare regulatory type of position mm. in industry. And so, um, you know, people can't tell me that I don't love animals. Yeah. You've got a, a real firsthand experience with them at, at all stages of life. And yeah. I, I think that 
really kind of brings a, a closeness to it, I, I imagine, you know, much like mm -hmm. hunting with a primitive muzzleloader might. Um, yeah. Because you're so hands on with it. Um, there's a lot of a lot more respect, I think, to be garnered there um, through all of those processes. Yeah. I, I haven't received a lot of, of hate about this bear hunt. Um, Good. I've, I have received a few comments on social media that I've noticed. Um, you know, I don't get, I do not get bothered by that. Um, I don't usually reply because when someone has the, um, disrespect to comment under my post that I'm, I'm honoring my, my deceased grandfather, you know, with a mm -hmm. family tradition, um, you know, and he's obviously he's proud of me for what I've done. And, um, someone has the guts to say, you know, hound hunting isn't, um, isn't really hunting. It's like shooting fish in a barrel or something like that. It's just not worth my time to respond. Yeah. I'm sure they're, I'm sure their grandfather is so proud of them um, <laughs> for being disrespectful on the internet. And I'm sure they're just so proud of him for eating all his vegetables. Yeah. Right. So great. <laughs> Eat your veggies and stay off the keyboard. Leave me alone. Boy, it's getting chilly in here. <laughs> it could be it could be so much worse but oh yeah you know in those situations they're they just want to for some reason they want to try to hurt somebody's feelings it's not going to be me yeah well i think you've you know you've shown i think i don't know how anybody could look at that picture and not see the the perseverance in in all aspects of what you've done there i think it's just a a great story and i really appreciate you sharing it with me i just it's just a neat story and I, I just, I love hearing it. No problem. I'm glad I could. Um, you know, if, if it just leads to one a person that's a new hunter um, coming into the field or one person um, rethinking hound hunting even, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're a hunter and you haven't ever hunted with hounds and you, you look at it as though it's violent or disrespectful to the, to the, to the prey, I guess, um, just Try it out. Try it for yourself. You'll probably change your mind. <laughs> I like I like changing minds, whether it's about uh, dogs or hunting or muzzleloaders. I think that's it's good for people to be more more open about these things. Oh yes, definitely, definitely. And I know, um, you know, you don't see a lot of people hunting with muzzleloaders at all. And whenever I see someone hunting with a muzzleloader, of course, I'm going to follow that person on social media. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to root for them. Um, it's kind of, you know, a thing about being the underdog is when you defeat the giant, it's a, it's a way bigger deal. Yeah, for sure. I kind of had that feeling this past week. Yeah. I'd say you took down a giant looking at this. <laughs> uh, as we kind of, I, I think, kind of wind down here, I try to give the guests a, uh, um, you know, a couple minutes or, or however long you want to talk about something, you know, that you want to promote, whether that's a, you know, a social media handle or a website or a, a cause that folks know, you know, where to find you. If you want them to find you, if you don't, I totally understand. Um, or, you know, to direct people to a, a cause that you're passionate about. I, I'll put uh, any links that you talk about in the show notes so that people can find stuff pretty easily. Sure. Um, you know, definitely check out, you know, if you're into traditional muzzleloader, um, stuff at all um the nmlra um i'm a member and uh super interesting uh if you've never been to a shoot or um, if you've never been to a rendezvous uh check those out it's it's something that would be like super super interesting it's very educational people are really welcoming um and it's really a fun time um i mean if you want to see pictures of my bear hunt uh and my kids doing stuff like fishing and goofing off um different hunts i go on just normal life i'm not an influencer by any means i never will be um but i do have an instagram that people can look at it's at katie k-a-t-i-e underscore r-v-t it's just my personal page it's the only one i have and um welcome to get on there i mostly only post hunting stuff because that's kind of what i use instagram for mm -hmm. um because i just that's my that's really my hobby is just outdoor stuff and Instagram on, on Instagram. Um, and then just get, get involved with, um, a hunting, um, advo advocacy organization, um, whichever one you choose, as long as it's pro hunting, uh, remember to support other hunters. Um, I know people have a discussion over that, but basically whatever legal, um, method of take is, 
uh, please support that. Whether you want to participate in that actual method of take or weapon or species, um, remember that, you know, hunting has is very um, susceptible of dying the death of a thousand cuts, right? Mm-hmm. Just start whittling away uh, those anti-hunting groups at um, you know, baiting or hound hunting or, or different weapons, you know, and saying that they're unethical or inaccurate or whatever. Um, and as they start getting these tiny, winning these tiny battles, they're getting closer to winning the war. And I'd hate to see us like Europe um, or other countries that just yeah. barely have any rights. And it's ridiculous how many rights we've already given up in this country. And we all can see what's, you know, what it looks like right now out there in society. And this it's, all the political things, right, yeah. that's going on right now. Um, please be a supporter, whether you're talking to your neighbor, your friend, or if you're getting involved um, with an organization or speaking out online or a podcast or something like that. Um, make sure that you're doing your part, uh, whether it's donating or, or just um, participating. I think so that's, that's all uh, I thought. I think that's great. It's very admirable. <laughs> I love it. Oh, and also, <laughs> yeah. One little, one little side note. Um, you know, as a, like I said, a veterinary technician, an animal lover, and a hunter, and a farm kid. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of commercials on TV uh, advocating for the Humane Society of the United States. Um, in no way, shape, or form, giving money to them uh, is helping any of those animals on those commercials. Um, it's really not, um, uh, mostly what the Humane Society of the United States is doing, um, is going after, um, anybody that's a hunter, um, farming, um, they're, they're there to pretty much, um, make animals have their own rights, um, and not be, um, managed by humans. And I believe that we created by our creator who gave us dominion over the animals and it's our responsibility to take care of them. And that's what animal welfare is about. Mm -hmm. But animal rights, um, is a total off the wall bonkers idea. Um, so, you know, if you want to donate money to animal shelters and things like that, donate to a local one that is not Mm -hmm. associated with the humane society of the United States. That's, I think that's a cause I can get behind for sure. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> i will say you know posting posting on any of the muzzle loading uh pages on facebook and stuff like that about my bear hunt people were very 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 um supportive and Wonderful. it was great to see it great Good. to see it um i know it's funny I'd, I'd ran into a couple that that was um running the rand house there friendship like mm-hmm. just a few weekends ago on, uh, at the fall shoot yeah uh, the schlegels yes i saw both of them there and it's the first <laughs> time i'd ever met them and they were so sweet. They let me, they were closing up. They let me come in. And um, they also, you know, talked to me when I was leaving about, oh, you know, don't forget your gun, you know, just talking. And I said, oh, definitely won't. I'm going to hunt a bear with it next week. Hopefully I'll get, get a bear. My grandfather, you know, gave me this rifle and I'm really excited to go out there in New Mexico. And they just both kind of looked at me for a split second, like, huh? <laughs> and uh, they're like, oh, well, yeah, good luck. That'll be great. You know, and when I posted on the, the, NMLRA discussion Facebook group, they saw my post and oh. they both were like, Oh my gosh, we talked to you at the Rand house. And <laughs> How great. You're amazing. You did it. You know, your grandfather would be so proud. And it's just, you know, that was so heartwarming to see the muzzleloading community is, is really a, a close knit and a really supportive community. Yes, they are. Yeah. I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a better one out there. Mm-hmm. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? I don't. I kind of try to make each episode kind of a platform for the guests. So, if there's anything else you want to talk about, or if or if you're you know, fine to wrap it up, we can uh, we can close it out here, and I'll let you get back to your girls. Um, no, I think the, you know, we've pretty much it. Unless you have any more questions for me, I could talk about just about anything. I think. So, if you if you don't mind me asking, how did you um, hear about or find the NMLRA down there? Um, when I was, so I'm a huger, so, Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really, at first when I heard about, but just the friendship rendezvous, right? Mm -hmm. That's what people refer to it as. The first time I went, I was a teenager and just heard that it was something cool to go see and, you know, had to do with hunting and, and people were reenacting and stuff. I was like, oh, that'd be awesome. Um, went down there and saw it and realized that it was only muzzleloaders and I had already, you know, received my muzzleloader from my grandfather and he taught me how to shoot it and everything like mm-hmm. that. So it was kind of natural 
thing for me to be like, oh yeah, this is something I could really get into. And, uh, you know, I know, I know other people, little, you know, local people that hunt with a muzzleloader or have muzzleloaders. And so it was always something that I find a couple people like-minded and, and go down there and check it out and started there. Luckily, we have the headquarters, you know, in Indiana. Yeah. yeah. That helps. <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice to have that hub, you know, just a few mm -hmm. hours away. For sure. Well, cool. I always try to, it's, I don't know, it's not necessarily research, but I'm always trying to figure out how people get into muzzleloading to try to reverse engineer it so we can get more people involved with it and, uh, and yes. keep growing it. So I appreciate yes. you, sh you sharing that. I think if people could see a lot of the shoots and pictures of what's all going on during the fall and spring shoots on social media a lot more than we do mm -hmm. um that would be really beneficial yeah hopefully uh hopefully maybe somebody from there will hear this and uh <laughs> and, and hear a smart young lady talking about it and uh, and run with it maybe sure hopefully I'd like to thank Katie once again for coming onto the show to talk about this. Uh, she carved out some time during one of her uh, weekday evenings to talk with me. And I uh, can't say it enough. Thank you, Katie, for coming onto the show and, and sharing your story. I, I hope that we can inspire a few more people to get outside with their muzzleloaders and go hunting and, and be involved in the outdoor sports uh, like you are and like you're passing down to your daughters. We'll have links to a bunch of the topics discussed in this episode in the show notes below. So if you want to check any of those out, you can do so really easily with a quick little tap. If you want to learn more about muzzleloading or anything related to muzzleloading, you can visit ilovemuzzleloading.com. That's our homepage for the podcast and for the blog and for all the videos and things that we're putting out to promote muzzleloading, living history, traditional craft, and uh, muzzleloader hunting as much as we can. This is a passion project, so uh, my friends and I that are working on this it's really just a, uh, you know, waking up early in the mornings, working late in the evenings uh, to get this stuff out. We're not making any money on this. Don't really intend to, don't want to. It's just about preserving history and passing along these great traditions of, uh, of our contemporary muzzleloading enthusiasts so that we can save these stories for future generations. We have more information about this uh, giveaway that we're trying out at ilovemuzzleloading.com slash hunting. You can, uh, you can see it there and uh, learn more. There's some particulars, you know, if you're concerned about your own privacy or anything or don't want us to show your face or name online, totally understand. Uh, more than willing to blur that out and, uh, and censor any information that you don't want out there. Uh, totally respecting of your privacy. Um, if you want to submit a story with your uh, with your photo or anything, or if you want to talk on the podcast like Katie is today, please don't hesitate to reach out and ask. I'd love to hear some of your stories and uh, and share them with the muzzleloading enthusiasts out there, so we can keep these great traditions going. So, if you're interested in that, you know it's a, a free hat, chance to win a free hat, and uh, you know no cost to you. Tag us or email us your photos at ilovemuzzleloading at gmail.com. 